Welcome to the Endless Knot Podcast. Where the more we know, the more we want to find out. Tracing serendipitous connections through our lives and across disciplines. Hi, I'm Avon. And I'm Mark. And today we're asking the question, what is a recipe? This episode is part of the Recipe Project's virtual conversation on the topic of what is a recipe, which started on June 2nd, 2017, and is continuing until July 5th. Bookended by two panels of speakers that are being streamed online, it features a wide range of contributions on the topic in the form of blog posts, videos, podcasts, Instagram posts, Twitter conversations, and more. We'll put a link to the Recipe Project's blog in the show notes, or you can search the hashtag RecipesConf to join in the conversation. We are participating with this podcast episode and with a video on the history and etymology of the recipe, which will be released on June 27th on our YouTube channel, Alliterative. Today then, to discuss the topic of what is a recipe, and in particular some of the historical developments in recipes and cooking, we have the great pleasure to be joined by one of our favorite podcasters, Laura Carlson, host of the Feast podcast. Laura has degrees in history and medieval studies and a wide-ranging interest in food. Welcome, Laura. Hello. So let's start there with your podcast, because I know we've mentioned it before to our audience, but it is really genuinely one of our favorites. So tell us a little bit about it uh, for anyone who hasn't had a chance to listen to it yet. What is The Feast? Well, The Feast, I believe our tagline is Meals That Made History. Uh, What we really like to do is look not just at a food, but in particular an event or where food interacted with an event, an event interacted with food. So we'll take a snapshot, if you will, of either a specific meal or a particular tradition involving food and and tell the story, really. I mean, it's really a story-based podcast. Um, And we've been up and running for, I, I think, exactly a year. We just passed our one year anniversary. So we've done everything from, oh, I think our earliest one went Mm -hmm. back to the story of King Midas and the origins of beer and brewing in general. We have done papal feasts that have involved, you know, thousand pound sugar sculptures. I think one of my, I think we actually both covered this at one point, but it remains one of my favorite stories ever. Um, The massive uh, giant cheese that Thomas Jefferson (laughs) received for his inauguration inauguration which i still just think is is a hilarious story a one and why we don't have a tradition anymore of presidential cheese i don't i don't know um so that i think is it in a nutshell that every episode we we take one of those either specific moments like Tef- thomas jefferson and cheese but go back and explore a little bit of why exactly thomas jefferson would have been getting cheese what kind of cheese did he receive and why on earth did they keep it in the white house for what seems like multiple years <laughs> oh my <laughs> yeah, that combination of things, the fact that it's stories, which are just mm-hmm. fascinating to listen to, and the fact that you, every time, are drawing those connections between really interesting, just straight food history and all of the context and the social and political and historical relevance of that food is why I love the podcast. Yeah. Like the dinosaur episode, that was one of my favorites. <laughs> yes, the oh, dining inside you. a dinosaur. <laughs> I know. I mean, it it has all these amazing, I mean, as as you both, I mean, clearly do all the time, Mm -hmm. these connections between the very early history of paleontology, evolutionary science, and then, of course, you have this (laughs) this crazy meal inside a dinosaur cask in the middle of a London park, which I think is fantastic. So, yeah, we we try and, as as you yourselves do, um, pick out those little connections, uh, specifically with food, Mm -hmm. but that relate to almost every discipline or interest under the sun. Yeah, and every every topic takes you in different directions. Food is is such a universal, you know, you can connect it to all these things. Mm -hmm. Very rarely is any event in history done by people who aren't eating food. (laughs) Precisely. Exactly. There's always food or drink, sometimes both, often both, in the background. Now, before we go on on that topic, I have one question for you. You've just been on a trip that ties into your podcast. You've just come back from Spain. Yes. uh, Yes. It's actually quite hard to get back into (laughs) kind of Canadian weather and not having, you know, Spanish ham and cheese and wine on a daily basis. Um, Yes, we were walking a bit of the Camino de Santiago. We actually have been doing it, um, chipping away at it for the last five years. It's actually hard to think that we've been doing this for half a decade yeah so we will do just as vacation allows us um about a week 
uh, a year or a week every time we can get away and do another chunk. So we're, we're getting close. We um, this time did from Burgos to Leon, um, which was our longest bit ever. It was about, I think, 150, 200K, I think, 200 kilometers. Wow. But you, you get up in the morning, you walk about four or five hours through beautiful fields, vineyards, cows, things like that. <laughs> and then, of course, you get to have a gigantic traditional Spanish lunch or comida and mm -hmm. take a siesta, maybe go out, have a little bit more wine, cheese and ham, sleep, <laughs> and then do the exact same thing all over again the next day. That sounds pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it, I got to say, I recommend it highly as a holiday lifestyle um, because you get to go to these towns. I mean, the average population size would be something along the lines of maybe 100, 200. So these wow, very right. tiny towns, everyone is just so welcoming because the, the Camino has been there for you know upwards of a thousand years. And it's a very peaceful way of all you got to do is walk every day, walk and then eat, walk and then eat and then drink. It's 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 quite nice. Mm -hmm. And then you have a goal every day, too. So you That's know right. what you're doing. You aren't feeling like you're wasting your time or what should I pack my exactly. life with and what activities. Yeah. Somehow I feel like our kids would complain fairly heartily about that as a vacation style though the six-year-old is very hard to get even on a 10-minute hike at the moment <laughs> but we'll keep it in we'll keep it in mind for the, the long definitely. run definitely there's there's always the bicycle option too apparently you can now bicycle through the camino so it just depends on what cool. kind of what kind of vehicle i mean you can even do it the old school way of horses or mules or things like that so you see everything and anything um That's a guy was carrying cool. his cello across the camino which wow. i would never do but hey no. <laughs> Good job to him. Uh, so you really do get everyone and anyone on the Camino walking it or riding it their own right. individual way. That's amazing. Yeah. And I'll uh, post a link in the show notes to the specific episode I was referring to because you did an episode about pilgrim food on, oh, that, yes. on that journey. Yes. Yeah, Which was, I thought, really fascinating about the bread. Yes. And the, the chicken pastry is the town devoted yes. entirely to chickens, which as we found out this last time we were there, it is not just limited to that one particular town we went through another town that has chickens as their well official i was going to say unofficial but i think it is their official mascot that someone <laughs> saved all the chickens sometime in the year 1200 and so now they also have chicken pastries of another kind celebrating this chicken miracle so apparently chickens <laughs> in spain is a thing that happens i don't know <laughs> well, I guess they're important if they're your exactly. major food yeah. stuff. Yeah. But. <laughs> exactly, exactly. You see, I was thinking it was going to be all about ham, you know, lots of pigs and things yeah. like that. But the chicken, the chicken is an important Spanish animal, apparently. These are the things you just can't find until you do the research <laughs> on the ground, right? <laughs> exactly. The serious research, you know, walking through Spain. This is what has to happen. It's important to be able to dedicate yourself so strongly to your historical you know, you calling know, that sacrifice. you really sacrifice yourself. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly. A lot of sacrifice, a lot of, you know, tasting and trying things. But uh, I can I can do a big thumbs up on the chicken pastries. <laughs> uh, well, that sounds amazing. And I'm sorry that you have to be welcomed back to a climate that is not quite sure what season it's in yet. Oh, goodness, <laughs> Though yes. this week here, anyway, we we finally seem to have turned the corner towards summer. Yes, yes thankfully. Much. Yes. Yeah. It's, I think this today and maybe yesterday were the first days that it actually did feel like things were warming, maybe summer, yeah. maybe soon. Yeah. So hopefully we'll have a little bit of something to make you feel nostalgic for Spain, <laughs> if nothing else. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. But, you know, Canada does have its own culinary interests. Yeah, it does. Culinary oh, absolutely. history. You know, so segueing from that, what is it that drew you to food history in particular? Like, what's your background in what subjects have you been interested in that you ended up in this particular sort of overlapping set of interests? It's very interesting. And, you know, when you look back, I, I had no idea that I was eventually going to end up at focusing in food history or food studies or culinary history. But mm -hmm. when I look back, I think, well, of course, this this just this just makes perfect sense. Um, I was trained or I did uh, my early research in early medieval history. Um, I looked at the Carolingian, Charlemagne, and I was doing more things along the lines of intellectual history, textual history, things like that. Right. And, mm -hmm. you know, I just hadn't really come across a lot of people doing food history, particularly from the medieval side of things. Um, and it was only the big yearly conference that they hold up in Leeds in England um, one year right. that they were holding a special event in the conference that was medieval food and it was a chance for if you wanted to go to go to one of these medieval feasts as they were kind of billing it and a food historian had prepared 
all the foods and had a great discussion about each one of the courses or each one of the dishes that she had prepared, talking about how it was incorporated or epitomized an element of medieval society or medieval culture. So ranging everything from, you know, what a king would have had in the 12th century right. to, um, of course, what I found so interesting was Lenten foods, the idea that foods are really um, specifically made, obviously, for fasting and whatnot during the Lenten season, but mm -hmm. things like blanc mange that you actually needed to focus on the color of the food. Um, right. And it really started just fascinating me, but I didn't really know how to plug that into my research. And it was only when I came to Queen's University to start teaching and when I was starting to teach medieval courses there and trying to get the students a little bit more engaged in some of the topics we were doing. We were doing a Mediterranean course and mm -hmm. One of the big themes, of course, was interconnectivity, um, trade, uh, exchange right. throughout the Mediterranean. And again and again, it just came up, you know, naturally, why not food? Of course, you have Roman olive oil trade, salt trade, things like that. But of course, then you have the spice trade. And there ha had been that fantastic book, I think by, oh, was it Paul Friedman, who did an entire book about kind of the medieval spice trade, um, including recipes. Okay, right. And it, it was just a perfect, for, on one level, academic article about mm -hmm. the nature of uh, the spice trade, but also specifically food applications of that that included recipes. So I just threw it out to some of my students that, you know, if you wanted to try making some of the breads or some, I think most people were making breads, but some of the other elements that were mentioned by Friedman in, in this article, that go ahead and do it. And people just went nuts for it. Students just, Ooh, I mean, yeah grabbed onto what they were making breads they were making like uh what was it oh like the gingerbread and things like that yeah gingerbread, oh, yeah. gingerbread uh, um yeah. and just all these other things that all of a sudden they were they were firing on all so many more levels than they had <laughs> been before mm -hmm. and i had been cooking and and doing kind of a recipe blog and whatnot before then and it, it just was that moment of why, why have I always been keeping these two elements of my life separate of doing history on one end and then right. my f interest in food and cooking and whatnot on the other end. And it was that moment in the classroom that, of course, this this, of course, could be one like this could be a united element that I, I do and focus on in research and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And it went from there. And I'd been listening to podcasts for years. I was a big fan of things like 99% Visible and whatnot. Right. And that story driven narrative that I love so much, um, things like the Memory Palace as well. And right. I thought, well, this seems crazy that there isn't one dedicated to food, because as we were saying, food is inherent to all these historical moments, these mm -hmm. events, these transformations, and yet no one seems to be focusing on this thing that is the same throughout all all of these events or that is is um, the sidelines of all these events and sometimes you know it's just in the background but then at other times they can be right in the middle of things such as mm -hmm. Thomas Jefferson's massive cheese and have all these connections. Yeah, and it's such a point of connection. It's a place where people, just like your students, can see themselves and imagine themselves in that moment because it's so relatable. And they know what yeah. it's like to eat, even if they don't know exactly. what it's like to eat. That that you're talking about, it's exactly. something easier to connect to than warfare or politics or Absolutely. great figures on the world stage when you are none of those things. <laughs> right, exactly. I mean, especially I think, you know, a lot of times with medieval history, it is such a, you know, looking back a thousand years or something like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, students have an interest in the topic, but getting it to be relatable or more directly engaged that, well, mm -hmm. they had bread. I have bread. And I mean, it, mm -hmm. it sparked all these stories that one of my students had grown up on a commune and they had made, uh, you know, kind of wild fermented bread. And right. she was looking at this recipe for medieval bread. And she said, oh, well, this is the exact same thing. I mean, it just launched mm -hmm. so much more rich discussions than I had gotten when trying to talk to them about, you know, the Crusades or, you know, like mm -hmm. legislative policy or something like that. All of a sudden, primary food, sources of other types. Yeah, no, exactly. exactly. Um, it just sparked so much more. And I thought, well, this is again, this is something that is common to everyone. Uh, and it, it has that relatable element. Mm -hmm. There was a talk at the very beginning of the virtual conversation. They streamed a panel from the Berkshires Women's History Conference. 
And one of the people presenting on that panel was talking about using, not exactly the same way, but using food in teaching about the Columbian Exchange. Oh, and she yeah. challenged all of her students to, that their project was was basically to have every student choose a recipe that would not exist without the Columbian Exchange. That, in oh, other words, took elements from both, you know, obviously both sides of the Columbian Exchange in terms of food and to do some research on it and then to cook it and then do a, pre you know, sort of a, a presentation or a report on it. And many of them chose ones from their own ethnic heritage that they hadn't really thought about the way those ingredients had been incorporated or the tomatoes were so integral to their Italian grandmother's recipe. But of course, they were an element of the exchange or things about there was a Puerto Rican, I think, who who looked at how all of the various threads that went into the both the indigenous and the enslaved people's backgrounds and the immigrants and the Spanish and all of that came together in the food. And, and she said exactly the same thing, that the students were just, some of them thought going in, it was a make work assignment, but by the end of it, they were just, you know, utterly enthralled by what they were discovering and how they could share it with their families and how much it meant to them to be able to look into their own eating patterns and see so much history in it. And I think it, it just shows the power of that that connected thread, oh, just like your experience. Yeah, uh, And I love these approaches that try and relate the content to your everyday life, because mm -hmm. it shows why it matters. Yeah, but mm -hmm. without mm -hmm. trivializing it and saying, oh, we're just the same as them or whatever, mm -hmm. because one of the things it can do is show you the difference, too. Yeah. Oh, when absolutely. you look at medieval bread, you say, I eat bread, they eat bread, we all eat bread. And then you look at, you actually make their bread and think, oh, that's not quite the same. And then, and that's that important job for historians of trying to, to make the connections, but also the differentiations and the uniqueness of every period as well. Absolutely. And how much is, is folded into it? I mean, not to uh, belabor maybe like a bread analogy, but I mean, in terms <laughs> of, you know, these elements where the, what kind of materials were they using? And I mean, you have an economic element there or what kind kinds mm -hmm. of technology um, yeah oh exactly exactly or you know a religious element of that they would or wouldn't mm -hmm. use a particular ingredient or a particular ingredient at a certain time of year so i mm -hmm. mean there's so much that's contained on the plate that we can say yes it's all bread but the, the meanings and how meanings shift or are applied can mm -hmm. differ so radically and yes absolutely illustrate historical context or di differences or just elements of exchange that are all folded into either one dish, one recipe, etc. I think it's it is just so fascinating. Mm -hmm. One of the questions we always ask people when they come on the podcast is about, you know, unexpected connections in their life or connections and how they see it important. But I'm not going to ask you now because you've <laughs> made that very clear. <laughs> Your story is a perfect right. illustration yeah. of that. But I think I think what you were saying is completely right. I mean, food itself is an mm -hmm. example of that, yeah. of the connectivity of everything, where you can't look at anything we eat or drink in isolation and just exactly. talk about it as purely culinary because it doesn't work. You have exactly. to think about the economics or the geography or the history. Symbolism. Symbolism. Ritual. Food mm -hmm. is ritual yeah. and community, community and, and yeah. national identity and ethnic identity and language and all of those things come in. It doesn't matter how basic or exotic or trivial the piece of food or drink is. Absolutely. I mean, there is always something built into what goes onto your plate. I mean, it, nothing can just be without meaning or context or another layer of, of mm -hmm. something, um, which again, yeah, is why I find food so fascinating because it's never <laughs> just food. There's, there's something always more to it, to how it ended up mm -hmm. on your plate or why you're, you are or even aren't eating or drinking it. Exactly. Even when there's an absence of food that is meaningful. Exactly. So you've already partly answered this question too, but let's to move into discussing recipes more specifically. You started by asking some of your students then, or suggesting to your students that they could use these historical recipes to cook from. Had you done much historical cooking before that? Had you cooked from, you know, older recipes before that point? I'm trying to think of the timeline for it, but I think it was right around the same time. I've, I've loved cooking for, for years and so had mm -hmm. been experimenting with different recipes. It had never been from a really historical angle, though, um, mm -hmm. I want to say. But right around that time, um, I think it was the University of Reading was holding a, an online, like, you know, one of those giant MOOCs, uh, the massive right. open online online courses. And I want to say, I'm probably going to get the name wrong, but there's something called Feasting in the Elizabethan Court. Okay. And it was an entire online course where you watched videos that were filmed at uh, Hampton Court Palace, some of the other royal residences and things like that, that were instructed to 
you know, show you how food was both prepared and also the social um, economic role of food, particularly right. at the royal level at that point in time. And one of the major components of it was to do at home where here were some Tudor Elizabethan recipes. Uh, not only were they, you know, uh, for people who are <laughs> unfamiliar with that era of recipes, you know, there's very little in terms of quantities or mm -hmm. measurements. Right. Um, but of course, as well, you're not dealing with modern ovens or stoves, things like that. Mm -hmm. How would you prepare them? And of course, the combination of ingredients in and of themselves would be very unusual, probably, to modern palates. So I remember mm -hmm. one of the first ones they asked us to make was, I think it was a tart of peas. So it was mm -hmm. a pastry, um, I'd say like an open-faced kind of pie situation um, with, you know, regular kind of peas, English peas. Mm -hmm. But it was with grape must and sugar as well. <laughs> um, uh -huh. And you just kind of baked this thing. And of course, there were no measurements for the pastry. And I'm not a right. experienced pastry chef. And the peas just had to be put with, quote unquote, grape must, which I didn't have. So I was using like Welch's grape juice. Right. Um, <laughs> and it it was a, uh, you know, eye opening experience into actually applying these recipes, not just reading them as texts, um, mm -hmm. seeing them obviously as a, as a product of historical context and whatnot, but actually trying to make these in my own oven or, you know, on the stove yeah. or things like that and tasting this very unusual combination to us, at least, of mm -hmm. peas and, well, grape juice. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> and I was hooked because I just thought, again, here we are, of being able to to take this historical document, which so often, you know, you either see as a photocopy or if you're very lucky in a manuscript, maybe digitized, mm -hmm. but it it is just this thing on a page. But recipes have that ability that you can go and with some modification, obviously, there's an ability to bring them to life in a way. Um, mm -hmm. And I found it fascinating that I was I was there when, of course, you could then compare with everyone else's pea right. tartlet thing <laughs> <laughs> and there were about a thousand and one variations on it i was hooked um and so after that mm -hmm. you know we we started um because my husband uh brews beer i got him to try making sumerian beer which um yes <laughs> i cannot necessarily recommend <laughs> as a taste experience as a historical experiment absolutely but it it was again another fascinating way of my husband had been brewing beer so he knew the standards of this is this is how beer is made um mm -hmm. and then i presented him with this recipe where you have to basically make Sumerian bread and then that mm -hmm. bread gets you know mashed up um, in combination with some honey and dates and so it ends up being this mead slash wine slash beer concoction yeah. um, and it ends up being almost a science experiment as well because of these elements of brewing plus the ingredients um, yeah. Yeah. so after that I mean every time we find a recipe I, I have to convince my husband that he will try and <laughs> at least enjoy this um just we've had about a 75 percent success rate in terms of enjoying the recipe but it's always been really fun to to at least attempt the recipe uh maybe not the finished finished results but process and product are two different parts of the fun <laughs> exactly exactly and I, I keep trying to emphasize the process rather than the product although we had we've had some surprisingly delicious things um mm -hmm. you know there's always the the few things that we think well maybe we just won't finish this particular dish we'll just <laughs> we'll just declare that one an interesting experiment but but perhaps a noble failure yeah exactly exactly a many noble failures well, we came to sort of historical cooking in some ways in the same way, that is through scholarly slash academic interests in the beginning and through a background of just both liking to cook. But we did it. We started when we were grad students. And there was one particular book for yeah. me anyways that uh, really kicked it off, Plain Delight. Oh, by Constance Hyatt, Brenda Hosington and Sharon Butler, who were University of Toronto scholars. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, I was there and uh, I, I had this book and I, we just started experimenting, cooking these. And it, they, they do a lot of the, the work of translating to the sort of modern recipe, you know, how to make these in, a, in an oven. They supply quantities and modern techniques and that sort of thing to make it work. But they do include a transcription of 
the original. Yeah, so you can read the original recipe and then mm -hmm. try it for yourself. And then they give you their updating. And they're mostly from English and French cookbooks, I think. Yeah. And yeah, we just started cooking them because it was interesting and because this was, Mark was doing his degree in medieval studies at the Center for Medieval Studies in Toronto. And we were surprised, among other things, to find out how tasty a lot of them were. <laughs> Now they do, as I, as Mark said, they give you, they do the job also of giving you potential substitutions for some mm -hmm. of the things that hard to find are hard to find or that we technically have also... found out are poison now or things yeah. like that. <laughs> <laughs> they do also though tell you uh, some sources mm -hmm. for tracking down unusual spices. And this was back in, I won't say pre-internet days, but it was the early days of the internet. We're very old. <laughs> so <laughs> it was in like 99, probably around just before 2000. And so they had in the back these mail order and the first spices that because we wanted to buy some of the spices that you just could not possibly get. We mail ordered from this place in the States that oh, is wow. since online and now of you course. can order of course, things online. <laughs> yeah. But at the time we had to do this mail order. We still have some of the spices from that because, yeah. you know, you don't go through them that fast. I'm sure they're not that, that good anymore. Like mastic and grains of paradise. Oh, my Mastic is a type of resin, a resin from a tree. Yeah. You use it ground up and uh, grains of paradise are these sort of pepper like things but they're not and a bunch of other stuff that long I'm, pepper long right. pepper that's right oh wow it's amazing to watch the trends of spices or herbs mm -hmm. and things like that that things that would have been a staple in a pantry 400 mm -hmm. years ago we have to mail order <laughs> yeah yeah when we did the same thing, we ordered from, we were so proactive and energetic in those days. Weren't we? <laughs> <laughs> Looking back, it seems very hard work we did. Uh, we were living in a house in, in downtown Toronto and we ordered from a local herb place, Richter's Herbs. I'll give them a, a shout out because they're an amazing herb emporium in southern Ontario that we ordered, again, all these strange herbs and grew them in our garden so that we could have them for cooking because you don't use them anymore. They're, they yeah. dropped out of, you can't buy them at the grocery store yeah. and you can't buy them dried. And anyway, you want them fresh half the time. So a number of things. And we've just recently after, started doing that again. After a long hiatus caused by jobs and children and tiredness, <laughs> <laughs> we picked up uh, the books again last summer, really, and ordered, I ordered uh, Rue and Penny Royal, uh, Penny Royal and Calamint and Dittany Vervain oh, and wow. grew them on our porch. And, you know, it's fun, but it, yeah. it it shows you the sort of distinctions or differences, as you say. Things have become quite a lot more homogenized. There's certain herbs you can buy in the store and that's it. Yes. I, it was fascinating because I was listening to the BBC Food Program podcast um, and they were talking about, they were talking to a woman, I wish I could remember her name, but she's known as basically the herbal queen of England. Um, <laughs> and the reintroduction, and I hadn't realized this was so recent, of fresh herbs in kind of the English pantry that up ah, until... Right. The 60s and 70s, you know, you, mm -hmm. you would buy maybe dried basil or maybe dried parsley. But mm -hmm. the idea of using fresh cilantro slash coriander or even mm -hmm. fresh parsley or basil or rosemary, things like that, had oh, yeah. kind of fallen by the wayside uh, for a lot of British chefs um, or British home cooks. And mm -hmm. this this one woman who kind of started as a wholesale um, trader to places like Fortnum and Mason and whatnot had really mm -hmm. needed to sell the idea of using right. herbs again in in the British pantry. And of course now people like Nigella Lawson and Jamie Oliver, mm -hmm. I mean, they were all about fresh herbs and you take this and you kind of whack it in and whatnot. And now it's back mm -hmm. with a vengeance. But I thought it was so fascinating that even just over the last like 30 years that there's been a, a, a transformation of bringing just these, what we would might consider basic herbs, mm -hmm. back to the home cook um, and using them again fresh in, in one's cooking. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say, in fact, that that was restricted to U UK cooking. I think that was probably true in North America to a very large extent as well, even with some of the dried stuff, but certainly with fresh stuff. It's a, a real change. Yeah, she was she was talking about, you know, just the diversity of herbs that she has in her back garden, which, of course, mm -hmm. you know, she has like 80 kinds of mint and things like that. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. how still that even with, you know, when I go to my my Loblaws or my Metro, um, you know, there's a nice fresh herb section, which I, I now know to to be very appreciative of that. Mm -hmm. Even still, it's such a small proportion of yeah. the vast range of the kinds of 
you know, let's call them herbs or plants in general mm -hmm. that people have been putting in cooking for thousands of years. Um, yeah. And now I want to go in. And now that you've told me that it's, it, did you say it's Richter's herbs? Richter's, Richter's okay. herbs. Yeah, go online and you look, you will be lost for days. Oh, you will want the... I was just it looking at my condo balcony and thinking that we yeah. needed a few more herbs in our, our little <laughs> tiny condo balcony. Oh so. yeah, they the, the the varieties they have of every and that's what as you say like when we go to the store I can buy basil sure there's one kind of basil I mean Richter's probably doesn't have everything there is but has probably forty types of basil right you know on its list so yeah and just to to add I won't not to belabor the point but there is one story that I have to tell which is when we were living in New Brunswick just a few years ago uh, yes. ten, ten years ago now the local grocery store in Sackville New Brunswick very little town small town but a university town I got a tip from one of the faculty members when we were there he said if you want parsley he said they don't sell fresh parsley but if you go to the counter to the deli counter or the fish counter and you say do you have any parsley they'll go to the back and they'll bring you out a bunch and they'll give it to you for free because uh, they keep it to decorate oh, the, the cases as course. a decorative green but, people but they don't, don't sell it. it and nobody here <laughs> buys it so they'll give it to you for free and oh that's sure enough, amazing i went and i looked and it was not out there were no herbs on sale and i went <gasps> to this back and i said do you have any fresh parsley and they said oh yeah and gave me a bunch of it wrapped it in a paper towel handed it to me and i wasn't charged <laughs> for it <laughs> i love this idea that oh we were just using it to decorate not to eat yeah. at all just for no, decoration. to be fair to the people of sackville it's possible people grew it in their homes and gardens and stuff of course it's a very rural area but i think in general most people just would never think to use it so right. that would uh, you know that's now essentially right right exactly i mean very <laughs> small recently Canada. Yeah. Wow. yeah i was wondering if you had any uh memories of uh well i was gonna say noble failures but maybe noble successes <laughs> from uh historical cooking well we sort of probably have both I think one of our absolute favorite successes is a lamb dish oh uh, yes mm -hmm. which is in that plain delight cookbook it's clearly a north african and you know it must have come from the spanish area as and... yogurt mm -hmm. and preserved lemon yeah ah, yogurt, okay. preserved lemon. the other sort of i think success that was rescued from the jaws of defeat was we brewed meat ah. and it was not drinkable for a long time but it really <laughs> needed to be aged like a decade. Yeah. Oh. When he says not drinkable for a long time, he a, means a <laughs> we carried it from house to house as we moved three times in four years. Oh my. And finally, when it got to this house, we opened it. It really was a decade, wasn't yeah, it? It was it a was. decade old. Oh, yeah. We'd been opening a bottle from time to time and I consistently hated it. Mark kept saying, no, it's not that bad. And then we opened it after a decade. And it was good. Delicious. Yeah. Oh. Like, not totally sold on delicious, but it was good. Okay. All <laughs> right. Really, Mark really, I, I really likes liked it. it. Yeah, and oh, I, uh, wow. I like it quite a bit. Maybe that's a problem with our Sumerian beer; it just hasn't aged enough aged. yet. Maybe yeah. I just should leave it in the in the back of our fridge for another, well, maybe decade or so. <laughs> maybe it'll be <laughs> though, phenomenal. Though I gather from those ancient beers that they were not made to be aged; they no. were made to be yeah. drunk fresh. Yeah. So yeah. I'm I know. not sure. I'm not sure even the mead was ever really meant to be oh. aged, but. It did I, definitely change over time. One of the other great dishes that we really, really enjoy is Paris pies. Oh. And it's basically a meat pie, you know, in a pastry, except the meat filling has ground meat of various types, pork, veal, beef. And it has also, though, minced dates and currants in it oh. and ginger, sugar and salt. And then they say optional pinches of ground pepper or cubebs. That's another one of those ones we ordered. And, or mace and ground cloves. And you cook that and then, you know, cool it and add it to the pastry and, and cake, cook it as one big pie or as small pies. And it again, it's it's just a meat pie, but it's really good. That spice blend adding yeah. I mean, just and just elevating the fruit the too. Yeah. Oh, of course. Fruit. Yes, the fruit. And that reminds us, of course, of things like mincemeat. Mincemeat, of yeah. course. Which used to have meat in it and doesn't right. anymore, but comes from that combination of fruit and meat. Yes. And, I, and I, like, I, like, I like those sweet spices. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. With, the, with the meat. I mean, that I think is one of the great things about going back and looking at these recipes is both uh, you see those good recipes, but like you were saying, Laura, you end up realizing how you can change your own cooking mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. to take advantage of combinations that you didn't think of that have fallen out of favor or that are from a different place or a lot of these recipes i think probably use the spices yes because they taste good but because of course it was a way of sh showing conspicuous consumption and showing off so you can add spices to everything savory Absolutely. sweet doesn't matter <laughs> yes, <laughs> you're, yes. you're gonna find a way to use it and also for medicinal reasons as um one of the things that mark will be talking about in the video that is going to be coming out is the overlap of food and medicine and so yes. sometimes these spices are added because they're thought of as medicinal 
and or, thinking about the humors, balancing the humors. Yeah. And so you'd add them the right these hot spices. spices, for instance, or warm spices to food that you were going to serve in the winter so that you would medicinally warm people up and ward off illnesses and things. Yes. So the, the purposes may not have always been purely culinary, but they can instruct us in the way we cook Absolutely. today. And, and I think it's something that I've only started realizing has perhaps, I don't want to say has never gone away, but seems to be experiencing a resurgence even in the last maybe 10 to 15 years of, again, looking at food as, well, obviously nutritious, but mm -hmm. this element of a lifestyle that can either um, enhance or detract from a particular element of your health, uh, you know, with a uh, cold pressed yeah. juice, things like that, um, that there seems to be a, a new push again for this integration of food or or food products into into medicine um, or into this elements of a quote unquote mm -hmm. healthy lifestyle. The idea of superfoods, I think, exactly. kind of is part of that. The idea that, oh, well, if you drink pomegranate juice, it will ward off these six diseases and it will fix these seven conditions. And, you know, it's it's not just, oh, it's healthy because everyone needs to eat fruit, say. Right, exactly. Or it has X vitamin. But no, there's a particular medicinal quality to this. So you eat kale for this reason or you know, salmon will do this and they have this particular problem that it's going to solve for you medicinally. Precisely. I think, you know, I've seen about 3,000 different hair ads saying, you know, avocados. You right. have to have <laughs> avocados. I, it seems that you either have to eat them or you can just kind of like smash them on your head um, yeah. <laughs> that they will improve some sort of thing with your hair. It always seems yeah. to be a positive thing. Um, so absolutely. <laughs> There's a hair product out there that talks about nutrition for your hair. Yes. And it means yes. it does not mean eat eat these things. It means put it on your hair and somehow your hair will abs the hair the dead cells of your hair. <laughs> let us just all remember that. Yes. Will absorb Well, maybe it's the follicles. I don't, I know. don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> will absorb the food, the nutritious qualities of this particular hair product that has food in it. That has exactly. what we would consider edible products in it. Yes. And so there's always that that very blurred line between like mm -hmm. what if this is food, but also it has a very particular purpose or mm -hmm. um, restorative quality, quote unquote. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The other type of cooking that we've gone to is also ancient food, just to round off that con that discussion. Um, because I do Roman and Greek things, we've also got a number of books on ancient cookery. And so we've done that. And that can be even that much more complicated because we're battling not only different ingredients and different thoughts about food, but problems with translation of the oh, terminology yes. because we don't know exactly what species or what plant something is referring to. Or right. So there's a lot of guesswork and we only have a very small handful of recipes compared to what we have from the medieval period. So that can be fun too, but it can be a little frustrating sometimes because of how far you have to go in terms of trying to reach for any kind of authenticity with the with the ingredients. Can I ask a question about that? Because mm -hmm. I, I was um, actually just thinking about it because I know a lot of times, particularly with Roman cooking, mm -hmm. you have Apicius and that's kind of like the big guy um, because yeah. I think, you know, he's been translated a bunch of times and he kind of stands out as the Roman cookbook. I mean, for better, or for worse. Mm -hmm. But I was wondering, I, I just haven't encountered it. Is there a similar source that is usually called upon for Greek cooking or ancient Greek or classical Greek cooking? Well, not as direct as Apicius. So, you know, not somebody who sort of, here's a cookbook. Right, cookbook okay. This. But I have a book that was given to me um, in an online Twitter Santa exchange by an anonymous <laughs> uh, gifter. Well, I found out who it was afterwards, but it's published by the British Museum and it's called The Classical Cookbook. And this is actually one of the reasons we did get back to cooking because I was given this two Christmases ago and thought, oh, we have to start cooking from it. And it talks about where the Greek ones come from. And she draws a lot of inferences. So she goes to like the Odyssey's description of food and right. feasts and sort of tries to explain what some things would be. So there's a lot of guesswork. There's a document from 400 BC called the Banquet of Philoxenus, which is a poetry, but it describes a literary dinner party. So it sort of describes everything in detail. It has lines like a casserole with noble eel with a look of the conjure about him. Uh, honey glazed <laughs> shrimps, squid sprinkled with sea salt, baby birds in flaky pastry and a baked tuna, 
So there's a lot of, again, expansion from that. Sweet pastry shells, crispy flapjacks, toasted sesame cakes drenched in honey sauce, cheesecake mm. made with honey, milk and honey, a sweet that was baked like a pie. So those aren't recipes. But dishes back at least, to that, yeah. Are they recipes? Mm-hmm. But they're descriptions of enough ingredients that you can give some ideas about what you would do with them and how they were cooked. And so okay. she goes with okay. that. But there is not really the same instruction manual that we have with Epicius. So she's had to draw from a number of other literary sources that just mention these things. There's also Athenaeus and Archistratus are two. And there's an some fragments from papyri that have some cookbooks. So there's no sort of one go- go-to source for Greek cookery the same way. But there's a number of scattered references and a few actual recipes that you can go- draw from. But okay. it is much more complicated to find than the Apicius. Okay, yes. I mean, that it is nice, at least, that we have something resembling i mean it is really a cookbook yes um and it's i was just wondering because i hadn't found anything let's Mm -hmm. say the greek equivalent of a picky so i was wondering if there was a a source that people were were relying on more than another but it seems like it's a combination of kind of epic plus yeah papyrus sources and things like that yeah so i think that's one of the reasons that you don't well there's a couple of reasons but one of the reasons you don't hear as much about recreations of greek food is we mm-hmm. don't have the same kind of, you know, we have Cato and Apicius for Roman food. And between them, you can do quite a lot of, you know, pretty close approximations of what they probably did. And then we have things like Pompeii that give us right. actual physical remains and lots of wall paintings. And, and it, the so the sources are much richer for giving us that kind of information for Rome than they mm-hmm. are for Greece. Okay. So you have to do a lot more guesswork with the Greek stuff. <laughs> Now, what I'm curious about is if there are any modern cooks recreating Roman cookery who have tried to do dormice. I bet you there are. Where do you there source must. the dormice from? <laughs> well, that is an issue. <laughs> well, you know, there are like, you know, you can order anything online, right? Um, because, Google it. <laughs> exactly. Well, you know, there was that, you know, this this just shows how many podcasts I've listened to. But um, there was that fantastic, I think it was a Planet Money episode where oh, yeah. they cooked, I think it was a 16th century recipe of a peacock. Yes, 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 I remember that. Yes, yes, and I so I want to say, you know, it. that the, whatever meat source they use there, <laughs> where you can buy a peacock, you might be able to buy a dormouse. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they used to raise them in pottery jars. So if you could, f- if you can buy one dormouse, Mark, <laughs> exactly, exactly, it would be very long beca- before you could have yeah, enough m- dormice. Enough, yeah. <laughs> a, a, a fleet of dormice, Sorry, whatever. They let me put that back there. Two dormice. Two you dormice. have to buy two, two dormice. Yes. <laughs> Then you can have enough for a feast in a few, <laughs> a few months probably. Yes, <laughs> yes. So actually, that's a but that question about the Greek sources though I think is a good segue into what I do want to sort of talk about before we finish, which is that question that we started with and we've circled around it already. But the question that the virtual conversation was posing: What is a recipe? Hmm. What you know? How do we define it? I don't think we need to come to any final conclusion about it. In this. <laughs> the three of us will rule on it. <laughs> <laughs> that, and that's it. That is the end of yeah. the discussion. We have decided. <laughs> the conversation's over. Exactly. No, um, but one of the things about, and you've already brought this up, about looking at historical recipes is it makes you realize that the genre is not fixed. Recipes from the Elizabethan period, recipes from the Roman period don't look the same as recipes in a Canadian living magazine now. Right. So as a genre, what defines it, do you think? I think, you know, from from already our our wide discussions of it, I I -hmm. was mulling this over my mind and something that just seems to at least pop out as far as how would I distinguish between as we were saying in the epics of a description mm-hmm. of mm-hmm. of like a tart or or something that was enjoyed at a specific feast you know odysseus mm-hmm. enjoyed x y and z um i think for me i'm inclined to think of a recipe as something that when um when written down or or you know transcribed in any way um there's an authorial intention to be replicable and i'm going to try and say that ah. again oh. replicable there we are <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a really good definition at, or you know element of a definition. You're right because that gets around one of the tricky questions or many of the tricky questions, one of which is is a recipe a list of ingredients or a list of instructions or does it have to have both? And cuz I can immediately think of 
counterexamples for either, yeah. right? Like Right, right. There are recipes that are only instructions and that really they don't give you quantity, certainly, but even may not even give you really very much guidance on what the ingredients are. Right. But then there are other recipes that are just lists of ingredients and don't give you instructions on what to do with them because they think or very, very little. But if if it's about here is something that is intended to give you a way of replicating the end product. Exactly. I I mean, that's that's where that's at least mm-hmm. the starting point in my head, because as as exactly you were saying, there's so much cultural knowledge or assumption of knowledge mm-hmm. often uh, baked in to recipes. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Um, oh, I'll never forgive myself. OK, but <laughs> and I, I mean, that's the only thing that I think is a thread that. I I think is malleable mm-hmm. enough to be mm-hmm. applicable to these very very distinct um, I can't even call them genres because we'll we'll kind of put recipes as well a question mm-hmm. mark genre but let's say a mm-hmm. kind of a section of say information communication text what yeah. have you um, that there is at least from the person who was writing it or painting it or however it is they were transcribing it there was the intent that whoever is accessing this information will go away and be able to recreate this tart or this lamb dish or this beer. Um, yeah, perhaps. Or I might, I might even expand it slightly from that, that the intention on the authorial part is to give someone a means to replicate the desired effect ah, even. Yes, yes. Because I think a lot of recipes are not, here's how to make this exact tart. Mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. you know that so the recipe might be a tart for celebration say or a right. tart for fast day and what they're going to give you is a set of instructions or some kind of information that will allow you to produce a tart for a fast day Absolutely. that therefore you know doesn't have meat and doesn't have this and doesn't have that in it but because I'm, I'm thinking of the many many recipes that say you know take this kind of meat or that kind of meat and <laughs> add this or don't add this and add these greens or add some of whatever greens you have on hand or, you know, whatever. So very clearly the intention is not that you're always going to come up with the same exam- result. But that Absolutely. you'll produce something appropriate. That you'll produce the result, which is, you know, for mm-hmm. this health benefit or has, it can be served at this occasion or will do this in your meal, will give yes. you <laughs> the right thing in your right. meal. Absolutely. Um, and I, I think that's a yeah. much better way of looking at it, because I think, you know, if we're only to look at even, let's say, the latter 20th century in a very mm-hmm. limited context, I think there was this. And, you know, getting back to that, um, you know, pea tart that I was doing um, <laughs> with that giant mook that there was maybe this false, I don't even want to say assumption, but there was this element of the scientific nature that recipes could embody that if you follow this exact teaspoon plus this exact cup of Mm -hmm. whatever plus this exact liter of whatever, I don't even know what this recipe is making, but let's just go with it, (laughs) that no matter where you are, who you are, it will always come out the exact same way. And I think that that was a very, very minor tiny blip in the history of recipes because i think you're absolutely right that for so long it wasn't about what your pea tartlet must look exactly like my pea tartlet we're we're doing a a much broader thing here in saying well we are making a a tart for a feast or we are mm-hmm. making a tart to improve circulation for example mm-hmm. um that even drawing in that medicinal element that we were talking about before mm-hmm. And that's not to say that some recipes don't want you to get an exact result. I mean, even from, you know, some medieval ones or whatever, there may certainly some of them may have a very precise result, but I don't think it's integral to the idea of a recipe that it be that you'd be trying to replicate exactly the result. Absolutely. uh, In the way that we tend to now. Yes, you're quite right. Now there's a success and a failure for a recipe. If you do the recipe right, it will produce only this one result. Exactly. That That's your, how we think of recipes now. Your dish must look like the picture. <laughs> and if it yeah. doesn't, you've done something wrong or the recipe failed. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And then one last question I had just because it came up just before we were starting, it suddenly occurred to me to think because somebody on Twitter, I think, in the conversation brought this idea up. Does a recipe have to be written down? Is there an element of literacy? Like what, or put it a different way, what is an oral recipe is it a recipe or not oh my that that's a very interesting question i mean from an 
oral perspective, I'd be inclined to say the the very stereotypical, you know, your grandmother teaching you mm-hmm. how to make cookies or something like that from something that has not been written down, if ever, you know, for the mm-hmm. last century or something like that. I mean, saying, you know, you take a, a, a pinch of this and a mm-hmm. canful of that or something like that, I, I, I would include because I think as a recipe, um, because I think it adheres to if we're sticking with our replicable our def- yeah. definition that that is i mean you're you're learning to make you know chocolate chip cookies or a stew or something like that so it is a replication again of of someone's idea of a dish um hmm i don't know what do you think i i would i would agree with you that in the same way that uh we can talk about oral literature mm-hmm. i think it's you know the genre can exist apart from the the medium right in a sense the idea is if if we think of it in sort of meme terms right it's mm-hmm. a sort of it's an idea that the recipe itself is a replicable idea, whether that's passed down through an oral tradition mm-hmm. or through a literary medium. I think it still counts as a recipe in a sense. Yeah, because I think if it doesn't, then you need to figure out what it is that allows foods to have a traditional form. Yes. Because, you know, so many, when we think, the first thing we think of almost when you think of traditional is food. <laughs> I mean, there's other stuff too, but it's a, a major element of what we consider traditional cultures have traditional foods, traditional societies have traditional foods, and they don't just have the ingredient, but they have a way of cooking mm-hmm, it. Mm-hmm. And there is some way in which those things are replicated in each generation successively. You know, successive cooks know how to cook the thing in the same way. And they become, if you think about Italy and its its myriad of very specific ways of making certain sauces that are regionally specific. And you have to know your way from your town of making that thing Mm -hmm. or you don't belong there, (laughs) essentially. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But that means that there has to have been a continuity. Of course, it'll have been changed, but there has to have been a continuity. And if you don't have something you can call a recipe, then what is it? Yes. Do we just say it's tradition? And then what distinguishes it? Because there has to have been somebody, you know, all the way through, there has to have been at least a somewhat conscious desire to pass on a particular form of something to the next person. Absolutely. I think, you know, it plays on a, an element of experiential knowledge of mm-hmm. that you experience a dish um, or you experience making a dish um, and that mm-hmm. knowledge that you've acquired both through tasting and or making you can then pass down orally or pass along orally to someone else. Either you're standing over them, watching them stir the polenta and say, no, 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 you're going to have to do that about a hundred more times or another method. But I think, I mean, fundamentally, I I think a recipe is conveying this experience of either Mm -hmm. making or, or, or experiencing Mm -hmm. some way this, this dish. Um, And already we're getting quite, blurred because I'm thinking, well, you're right, food, drink, <laughs> medicine, everything. But well, I, I, yeah, I was just going to say, in fact, logically, then if we say that and we say, OK, then that can be an oral and it can be experiential because maybe maybe it's not even oral. Maybe you just literally watch somebody do it. Right. And right. Take part in it. But they don't never give you an inst- even a verbal instruction. Mm-hmm. You just simply just sort of do what learn, they do yeah. and you watch. And learn. As soon as we've expanded it to that. Now we're saying a recipe isn't even necessarily verbal. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and. Yes. And really, what's the difference then between that and learning a craft, any craft, you know, a potter making a pot and having an apprentice learn how to make a pot, because obviously they're trying to replicate the same result and they're being instructed on it. And and that's not to say that I I think that undermines the definition of the recipe. I think that what it does, though, is it tells us, you know, can we use the word recipe to describe things that aren't food? Yes. And that's already been a discussion point in this mm-hmm. conversation. I know, I mean, some of the things that are often brought up are things like knitting patterns. You know, it, is, is a knitting pattern a recipe? By our description of that it's something where somebody has an intention to communicate to someone else so that they can replicate the result. Mm-hmm. A knitting pattern absolutely is a recipe. Wow. I... So, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, I, I absolutely see them along the same spectrum. Um, yes, yes. And I think there is that element, again, focusing back on the replication element. And that can be quite broad in and of itself. Mm-hmm. Because it's going to be replication with variation, of course. And there's exactly. always room for the individual cook or the individual maker exactly. to change. But then they've changed the recipe, too. Mm-hmm. True, true. The, the original recipe doesn't disappear because the next cook makes it differently. Exactly. And exactly. that maybe is also something about there has to be some sort of, I don't know if the de- definition needs to involve some sort of permanence or lasting element. That would then step us back from purely nonverbal or even verbal 
you know, does a recipe have to exist past the moment of transmission? Right. Right. I, I think that is a really good point because you can then move from, well, there was the original authorial intent of replicating this this thing. Mm -hmm. um, but does that necessarily mean that whoever comes upon it, hears it, reads it, whatever, just mm -hmm. because they might use it and produce a different result that doesn't necessarily disqualify the original as a recipe. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Interesting. Oh, oh man, semantics. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have well, to bring it back to linguistics somehow on this course, podcast. <laughs> of course. I'm not like, go away and think about this for about four hours. It's like, is, is this a recipe? Is oh, this my. a recipe? I don't yeah. know. Is that a recipe? <laughs> well, and we can get into the whole question of, you know, what does authorial intention matter in a sense? But I, I think it's possible to define a genre by an authorial intention. That is distinct from saying how does it function in the world. In the world, yeah. But yeah. a genre, you know, a genre is created by authorial intention, I would suggest, yeah. as mm -hmm. well as by end result. I mean, I think that's not the same as saying, what is the meaning of the text? <laughs> right. The meaning right. of a recipe, <laughs> of course, convey... Can, can a, a, be quite different. Yeah, I mean, I mean, all of the stuff we were talking about, the, the role of food... Mm -hmm. All of that is contained in a recipe. When the writer writes it down, they aren't trying to convey elements of their social class, right. their economic position, right. the technology of the time, <laughs> all of that. Because, yeah. of course, the, still the purpose for the person going to the recipe can, can vary widely. You yes, can be going absolutely. to it for a lot of different reasons. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That will depend also on your position. You know, you'll go to a recipe for inspiration or for something to follow literally down to the detail depending on your level of cooking ability mm -hmm. for instance or yeah. some technical point of mm -hmm. the preparation technique yeah. you know how how long do i need to to let it cook mm -hmm. for it to be tender mm -hmm. but i'm going to use different flavoring yeah exactly yeah. exactly yeah i mean i'm i'm it's just so fascinating because you can approach the this one thing if we're going to call it the one recipe from so many different angles. You know, I'm, I'm just using an example, for example, of like Julia Child's beef bourguignon, right? Of there's mm. so much packed into how and why and when in the context in which Julia Child wrote one recipe for beef bourguignon. But then yes. the billions of people who have gone to Julia Child's beef bourguignon can range mm -hmm. from anywhere of, well, I'm going to make a shrimp bourguignon to I'm going to make it as part of a blog and eventual movie series uh, <laughs> yes. illustrating my transformation as a cook or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, so there's so much, so many different angles to approach both Julia Child's writing this thing down and her own mm -hmm. experience of cooking it and what have her and coming to that one recipe and then the transmission of that to the billion and one chefs who then go and for many different reasons, use it, adapt it, change it that don't at all perhaps relate to or, or look anything like Julia Child's original. Yeah. If yeah. there even was an original. I mean, that's a whole different question. <laughs> on well, absolutely. And you can get and then you get into things like, you know, when Apicius wrote his cookbook, there is quite a lot of discussion among classicists about whether he ever thought anybody would actually cook those recipes. Right. Exactly. That is, was he, in fact, writing a recipe? Or that's was he writing, there's a lot of purposes he could be writing a, to critique or demonstrate the levels of excess and uh, oh. gourmandizing of his period. Or was he trying to show off what he knew about food because it is a way of showing his status? Or was it a literary and or academic scholarly exercise? You know, oh. lots of questions about that. And because we don't actually know, we can't talk to Epictetus, we still don't really know his intent. And of course, they are cook with a bowl. That is, you can produce food from his recipes. Mm -hmm. So they're not completely fant fantastic, but that doesn't mean he was doing, uh, you know, the equivalent of somebody trying to write The Joy of Cooking. Right, exactly. And I mean, you even see these today of uh, like Game of Thrones cookbooks and things like that, yeah. Or, yeah. or, you know, uh, cookbooks kind of taking... Uh, and bending the genre a bit of mm -hmm. are, are are these yeah. really cookbooks like The, the Joy of Cooking or are these kind of uh, humor pieces, things mm -hmm. like that? The Terry Pratchett book, Nanny Ogg's Cookbook, for instance. Ah, yes, <laughs> yes. You know, it, it has some things in it that could count as recipes and probably would taste fine. And it has things in it that are nothing to do with actually trying to produce food. And it's all part of world building and narrative and entertainment value and things like that. So yeah, oh, exactly. Recipes can be a lot of different things. And you, you could probably say that about a lot of contemporary foodie magazines mm -hmm. is that, yeah, maybe some people, some cook people from them. do cook from them, but a lot of readers, and I think, you know, the magazine producers know this, just get them to 
experience the reading of it and the yes. imagining the imagination the, of it the yeah. lifestyle that's portrayed yeah exactly yeah. and yeah. there you could get back to my point that a recipe could be intended for you to reproduce the effect uh -huh. not the you know not not the, particular. not the thing so that is you could write a recipe knowing nobody's ever going to make the food but the effect you're trying to produce is a particular effect that you want to reproduce in various people mm -hmm. and, right. and that has to do with the food but it does start to it does start to push <laughs> at the boundaries of what you'd call a recipe yes. at that point because yeah. you're getting a little metaphysical <laughs> yeah. yeah absolutely the emotion that's produced or the, the mm -hmm. sensation sense of belonging of, in a yes. community or the sense of literary knowledge or the sense of class participation exactly in a particular class Absolutely. And... oh my all right so we started with such a i was I, i'm like all right this is my one sentence definition and this is going to work and now we've just <laughs> oh pulled it in so many directions but it's, <laughs> it's absolutely true though that all these things we call recipes but but what are their what are the intents did, behind them this gets into that semantic or linguistic idea that there is no there is no definition mm -hmm. for a recipe mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What there is is a cluster of meanings and some things are peripheral and some, some things are central. So right. some things you could say, well, obviously everybody agrees this is a recipe. And then there's other things that share elements with the core recipe, but share other elements with that. So it's a cloud of definitional possibility yes. and things have a center are closer to the center or closer to the periphery, but there's no black and white between what is a recipe and what is not a recipe. Yeah, absolutely. I like that idea much more than a spectrum. I like the idea of the cloud. I think that that mm -hmm. encompasses much more of what we've been talking about the the, the humor yeah. recipes the uh mm -hmm. lifestyle recipes the medicinal but it's not that there's two poles between which you can move but exactly. there's lots of different axes on which you can be closer or further from a, sort of the most essential recipiness of something exactly and of course it also becomes a metaphor mm -hmm. yeah. so we of do course. talk about you know a recipe for a healthy life or a recipe for success or, or a recipe, recipe for disaster there's a good pessimistic <laughs> element of it there <laughs> Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, I think we should probably wrap up before we get ourselves so metaphysical that we can never find our way back to the food. <laughs> Lost in the semantic cloud somewhere. Yeah. But this has been absolutely fascinating and so much fun to talk to you, Laura. Yes, yes absolutely. It's it's been lovely. I was just listening to your uh, your King Arthur episode, and I now want to oh. go and, and watch because I'm I'm also on the on the fence about Guy Ritchie, so I'm intrigued as to what he's going to do for King uh, Arthur. Mm. Well, I'm he can he could use your viewership. I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not been a terribly great success unfortunately yeah i've heard that you know <laughs> it, there may not be the in, uh, inevitable sequel yeah there may not be the six movies he was signed on to do a deal for yeah but thank you before we go what are the upcoming plans for the feast when does the new season start and do you want to tease any of what you're going to go on to do oh sure for the month of june we're going to be trying something a little bit new getting back to the camino de santiago we're going to be releasing a mini series detailing our trials and travails mostly related to food oh, but also walking much walking um <laughs> on the trail <laughs> and uh, the things that happen to you on the trail uh when you're kind of in the middle of rural Spain for four to five hours a day in the in the beating mm -hmm. sun. Um, <laughs> and uh, I'll actually be at a radio workshop at the end of June. But after that, our uh, new season will start in earnest. And this season, or at least this upcoming year on the feast, we're going to be doing many clusters of themed feasts ah. shall we call so we have one all these teas called the forensic feast you know um dinners or foods that are based slightly around the land of crime i mean we're not going to get too Ooh. far down the <laughs> true crime podcast uh rabbit hole but certainly as i've been researching there actually are quite a few foods dinners eating mm -hmm. events that that circle around crime in some way shape or form so we'll be doing a kind of mini cluster on that uh we'll be doing foods of the gods uh legendary ah. foods so th these will be more little you know, four or five episode clusters right. uh that that share a particular theme and then after every cluster we'll be doing kind of one of the the big feasts that we were doing more along the lines of or that stand on their own like right, we were doing right. last season, but very much still in a similar story, narrative driven style, um, but just with a little bit more more clustering, shall we call it. Um, I'm going to mm -hmm. think of a fancier name for it. Uh, but <laughs> but right now I'm a semantic I'm, cloud. No, wait, that's exactly. Not work. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the feast semantic cloud. Um, <laughs> but yeah, we're, we're right now in the heart of researching. I'm putting together the miniseries for the community of Santiago and then things should be back up and rolling with uh, feast episodes regularly by July. So that's that's the plan for right now. 
Oh, that sounds great. Looking forward to it. And perhaps you can uh, remind everyone how they can find all this uh, wonderful material uh, online. Oh, yes. We are at uh, thefeastpodcast.org. We're also on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Uh, our handles are at feast underscore podcast. And of course, you can find us on Apple Podcasts at The Feast, the feast Podcast. We're on Stitcher, uh, Acast, uh, Radio Public, basically anywhere and everywhere good podcasts can be found. And so if people want to uh, follow up on anything you've said, I'm sure they can contact you there at Feast underscore podcast, as you said. Oh, absolutely. So thank you so much again. And to remind everyone, this is part of the Recipe Project's virtual conversation. And you can follow more information about that with the hashtag RecipesConf and uh, look online for all of this because it's, it's kind of scattered across a lot of different sites, but there's a lot of interesting content. Just before we started, Laura mentioned one that we are also very fond of, which is the <laughs> Spuddenly Farming oh, yes. <laughs> project oh, yes. for Great creating an experiment on potato growing, but it just has the best name. But there's a whole range of stuff and some of it is about recreating recipes as well. So it ties in with what we we're talking about today. Oh, wonderful. And thank you so much for having me. This has been so much fun. I think, as you said, we could be talking about recipes for about the next maybe two days or so. Yeah. <laughs> yep. yep. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks for listening, everyone. And don't forget to look out for our video on what is a recipe, which will be coming up on June 27th. And we'll be back soon with a conversation about Wonder Woman. For more information on this podcast, check out the website www.alliterative.net where you can find links to the videos, blog posts, sources, and credits. We've also got all the ways you can follow us. Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, G+, a mailing list, and Instagram. And please check out our Patreon, where you can pledge to support this show and our video project. You can go directly to the videos at youtube.com slash alliterative. Our email is on the website, but the easiest way to get in touch with us is on Twitter. I'm at Avensara, A-V-E-N-S-A-R-A-H. And I'm at alliterative. To keep up with the podcast, subscribe on iTunes or to the feed on the website. And please review it on iTunes if you can and if you've enjoyed it. It helps us a lot. We'll be back soon with more musings about the connections around us. Thanks for listening. Bye. And we'll be back soon with a conversation about Wonder Woman. <gasps> oh, sorry. I didn't mean to gasp and enjoy <laughs> at the end of that. <laughs> I'm just so excited. <laughs>